Hello, Bookmans, everybody. I am here with the Eric Schumacher today, and we are doing a little interview. So, Eric, why don't you go ahead and introduce yourself? I shall. Uh, so, I'm Eric Schumacher. I am, and actually, I know several other Eric Schumacher, some of whom are also are you know fairly well known. So, shout out to all of them, uh, <laughs> um, including uh, um, uh, an, an author pal. Um, so, uh, two, I think, actually. Um, but anyway, uh, so I'm I'm the actor Eric Schumacher <laughs> and filmmaker Eric Schumacher, um, and. Um, uh, I have been in the industry in one way, shape, or form since I was six. Um, was uh, trained into the performing arts by my parents, who were both actors. And, uh, you know, it, it really didn't take much for the, the bug to bite me hard. Um, and later uh, found that I could uh, actually was inspired somewhat after a, uh, uh, a, um, a Star Trek convention where I heard Michelle Nichols speak about the impact of Star Trek. And I realized hey, wait a minute, maybe I could actually control the narrative too and do some good things with it. So I was inspired to then study film later, which I did. And uh, so I make movies and, uh, um, and a variety of other uh, entertainment, uh, multimedia entertainment content. That's so cool. So uh, you have been uh, primarily in the film scene, but you uh, have you done any on stage productions? Oh yeah, yeah. I, I I kind of came out of. I mean, my earliest stuff when I was a kid, I did. I think my earliest thing was actually like a a model photo shoot for. I think a, of all things, I think it was actually a sustainability project. Um, and then uh, uh, most of my other work with the occasional film gig up until uh, years ago, um, <laughs> up until uh, I made a big transition was was stage. So that's kind of where I grew up as an actor. Um, and uh, not to say that stage is any less of a, you know, a demanding and important art, um, but it was. But I think that if you're going to become a, uh, a, a if you're going to go, to go into film, it's a really good idea to also get experience in theater. The discipline that it builds in you, uh, the instincts it builds in you, are absolutely invaluable and, and really helped me as I, you know, worked hard to get more and more into the film industry. Absolutely. Was it a difficult transition moving from theater to film or was it kind of just fluid? It wasn't a hugely difficult transition. I mean, I, I, I've, I've fortunately had some great mentors about career strategy. So I had, I mean, it, look, it's not easy for anybody. Let's let me quantify that by saying it wasn't easy, but maybe, you know, but the, the transition as a performer uh, in terms of performance technique and, and adapting that was not as difficult for me in part because I also received some really good training in acting for film. Um, and that was part of my general knowledge, which I then occasionally practiced while I was mostly doing stage work. Um, also, a lot of the theater work that I did was in very small theaters. So there's a very significant difference in performance technique when you're on stage in, in, front, in, a, in a large uh, theater versus a small theater versus in front of a camera or in front of a microphone if you're doing voiceover work, which is another of my specialties. Um, each of them have a different set of techniques based on who you're you know, performing for. And uh, performing in small theaters is a really great way to kind of get to, to learn some of the more subtle uh, techniques and, and hone them that are also necessary for film. Um, although I do, I do remember one particular experience where I just finished a six week run on a play um, as a lead. And so I was you know, on stage a lot. And uh, then I went on to a, a film set and uh, did my first scene and projected to, to the audience and just about blew the sound guy's ears out. He was like, ah, ah, ah. And I was like, I'm sorry, I'm sorry, I'm sorry. You know, so. <laughs> Um, but other than that, I mean, you know, the performance side, I, I certainly you always grow and learn more as you, as you work the art and continuously train, which is a wise thing to do. But, um, I would say the shift from performance technique to, from theater to film wasn't maybe as difficult for me as I know it has been for some of my colleagues. That's good. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, there is a lot you can connect, can connect between, you know, film and theater, theater, 
T-R-E. Uh, and, you know, the, the, a lot theater. of it overlaps. But a, lot of it, it, <laughs> a lot of it is overlapping, but, you know, there's so much of yeah. it that's different, especially with like the audio and whatnot. So uh, also for, just like the the, the, the the subtleties that are necessary. I mean, if you're performing oh, yeah. in front of an audience, you know, you need to you need to be a little bit more demonstrative of certain things and your facial expressions may need to be broader. Whereas, you know, particularly I always one hot tip whenever I'm working on in front of a camera, I try to find out what my frame is at that moment. And, you know, or, or, or if there's several cameras, which is a dominant uh, mm -hmm. shot that they're looking for, so that I know whether my facial gestures need to be very subtle or I need to make them slightly bigger or how much movement space I have. Whereas in theater, it's all bigger, you know? It's bigger. Oh yeah, absolutely. The, the camera does most of the uh, features for you. <laughs> So um, out of all your roles you've played in the past, um, what is your favorite one? That's, uh, that's kind of like asking me to choose between my children if I had them. Um, <laughs> uh, you know, it's, that's, a, that's a really, really difficult uh, question to answer. And uh, I'm rather picky about the projects I take these days. So, uh, so you know, it actually would be an easy thing for me to say the most recent. Um, however, that being said, I do have some that I that I had, you know, particularly amazing experiences with. One of which was when I played uh, uh, Doc Holliday in uh, Tim Stone Rashomon, directed by the amazing and legendary Alex Cox um, of uh, Repo Man fame and Sid and Nancy and so on. Um, and that was a it was just a particularly challenging role. Also, I mean, a complex and fascinating one, working with a you know a really terrific team. Um, so I, for example, I starved myself for 30 days to look as uh, thin as I could. He, Doc was, you know, died of tuberculosis, so he was very thin. Um, and uh, I don't drink, but I learned to. Um, <laughs> I don't, uh, you know, I, I, I studied a lot of things and really researched the character and uh, deeply and uh, uh, be, tried really hard to become what I thought might have been something close to the real man. Um, and that was just a very singular experience. Um, and then particularly having uh, some opportunities to be a present at some pretty amazing screenings and you know, get a lot of uh, um, uh, uh, re review feedback and so on. Some of which was very negative and some of which was the exact opposite, incredibly positive. Um, that was a very interesting experience because doc means a lot to people, you know? Sure. Oh, yeah. um, and uh, of course I've really enjoyed playing uh, uh, John Burns in the Re Revenge of Zoe series. Actually, I I'm known mainly as a character actor. I like to disappear. I, I like it. My, the best compliment people have given me is, were you in that movie? And I was the lead, you know? Um, and uh, I actually had somebody say once, why that the guy who was playing that, that one character was really, really good. And, and, and it turned out it was me. Um, <laughs> uh, and um, so that's a high compliment for me, but uh, John is kind of like a very um, extreme version of myself, a big nerd and a little, up, little uptight, a little Kermit the Froggy as a lot of my colleagues call me. Um, so, uh, so that's been a lot of fun. Um, and I, I can't say too much about it, but in the current uh, project that we hope we'll finish and release soon after we can get back on set's uh, horse camp, uh, all I can say is his name is Bill and he's bloody hysterical, really great character. You can't wait. Do you find yourself like keeping a part of the characters that you um, portray uh, into your own personality? Does that make yeah. sense? Oh, yeah, yeah, actually, uh, you know, for me, acting is a very deep uh, experience, and I, I I I learn a great deal about myself with every character. Um, <clears throat> I've played. There was a period of time I, I don't norm. I'm not normally bearded. This is my COVID look. Um, but uh, for some reason, the be bearded me I guess looks really intense. And for a while, I was getting a lot of ser getting cast as a lot of serial killers. Um, and uh, and and I. But you learn a great deal about self honesty. Uh, you know, especially when you're playing a sociopath who changes the, the, their perception of the truth based on what they want um, and extreme selfishness. You learn, um, you know, I, I, every character I've played has not only uh, taught me a great deal about how to be a better person or to have more compassion for other people, to see it from an entirely different person's perspective, part of why I really enjoy character roles. Um, but also, yeah, I mean, you know, it, those characters do stick with me and they, they're, it, 
it it'll sound a little weird, but it's kind of like I have a bunch of people in my head now, and if I need to call on one of them, and sometimes their skills, which is a little amazing, sometimes their skills, I have them. <laughs> Even if I didn't have those skills personally, every once in a while, the way they think just kind of flips a switch. I don't know how else to explain it. So yeah, they're always around, and uh, um, it's it's a very loud place in my head. Well, that actually perfectly brings us to the next question. Uh, according to your IMDb page, which I uh, read through thoroughly, uh, you are a master of vocal characterizations and sound. Uh, we desperately would like to hear some of those. Will you show off this skill? Well, sure, I'll, I'll do a little bit. Um, let's see. Uh, that's all, folks. Uh, uh, Hi-ho, this is Kermit the Frog. Uh, we are here on the planet Coosbane, observing the oh, Kermikins, my little Kermikins. Who are you talking to right now? You should be paying attention to me. Hey There's a little bit of it. Um, <laughs> suffering, fuck a tash. Um, yeah, so I've, I've been doing uh, voices since I was a little, uh, a little kid, and... Uh, used to sit in front of a television and uh, just watch and try to figure out how to do the voices. Ever since, you know, the first, some of the early cartoons I was exposed to were Looney Tunes cartoons. And uh, somebody told me that Mel Blanc did all those voices. And I was like, really? I can do that then. <laughs> and uh, then I later had the benefit of studying, well, my mom, first off, is an amazing speech teacher. She teaches speech for the actor and how to gain an, a, a dialect, lose a dialect, uh, how to change your how to project a whisper across a you know giant theater so on and so on so i gained a lot of vocal technique and a lot of vocal flexibility working through her uh or with her and then later i had the benefit of studying with some fantastic voiceover teachers uh susan mccullum jay ginsburg one in particular i had i had the benefit of studying with lucille bliss who was the original smurfette on the saturday morning cartoons um and uh uh so i i had a lot of you know, great mentorship in building the skill sets, but uh, it's it's also just something that I've had a terrible passion for for years, and you know, every once in a while uh, had the opportunity to apply the art. That's so amazing! I'm I'm very very jealous of that skill. It's something I've always wanted to try out, but it is never... trainable. It just takes a while. It takes a lot of you know to sure. it, unless unless you're born with a natural flexibility and strength of the vocal cords, um, you have to have a really good ear too. But, but I mean. I just intentionally trained myself. So I, I know it's trainable because I didn't have the skill until I worked it for years. So right. if you oh, want to learn sure. some techniques, I'll teach you. Oh gosh, <laughs> all right. That'll be a later time for sure. <laughs> all right, so um, we talked about this a little bit in our correspondence, but uh, tell us the story of your iconic black fedora. Ah, uh, the iconic black fedora. Well, so first off, I'm a big fan of of fedoras, uh, I have often said that actually my uh, my fashion sense was left somewhere in the 1940s in this ideal, um, and this probably has something to do with also being uh, raised in part um, on classic films. One of some of my early actor training, my dad used to take me to a theater in LA where we lived um, that just showed films from around the 1940s, and uh, so I saw. Um, you know, I discovered I, I, I discovered that I was a, a cisgendered heterosexual male when I saw an American in Paris and uh, was introduced to Sid Charisse. Uh, <laughs> um, I, uh, you know, saw Humphrey Bogart movies and so on and uh, uh, Errol Flynn movies and all those things and, and, and boy did I fall in love with the fedora. That look was just really cool. So, um, you know, I've kind of, I've had a couple of fedoras over the years and uh, one day, I was in Bookman's East and store. sitting, <laughs> your store, your store and sitting on a shelf um, in sort of that, that room that, that uh, uh, you know, has just all kinds of unusual things that I would check every single time I walked in. Um, sitting there was this lovely thing. <clears throat> and it was quite reasonably priced. And I said, well, come on, there's only one of these. There's no way that's going to fit on my head. Now, it, the headphones, it doesn't quite fit quite right, but it turned out it did fit very well, and I nabbed it, and since then, it's been like my trademark at uh, Comic-Cons and Sci-Fi Cons and stuff, um, and film premieres and so on. Typically, if I'm at one of those things, you know, look for the hat. It's there, <laughs> and uh, at some points, I felt like my hat was more famous than I was, in fact. Um, <laughs> um, so yeah, I mean, so like I have a couple of Instagram photos. Uh, one in particular is just the hat on my knee, and it blew up on Instagram for a while. So, <laughs> um, 
so I, I'm, I'm enamored with the hat and it's with me anytime I can get to a public event. I love that. What a story. <laughs> it's like two lovers finding each other now. <laughs> it kind of was. It was like, where have you been all my life? <laughs> Sitting on a shelf, darling. <laughs> Come, put me on your head. Does that sound as bad as I think it does? <laughs> well, <yeah. laughs> Let me sit on your head. Hey, I have. No, thanks. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so, um, uh, like you said, you are a frequent customer of Bookman's. Of course, I am. maybe not so much now because of the pandemic. That but thing, yeah. uh, so, when you are uh, browsing our shelves, um, what sections do you frequent most often? Aha, well, that's an easy question because uh, I'll go into Bookman's with my wife and I have to do my, my, my path, <laughs> um, which includes, of course, the sci-fi fantasy section because I am a mega nerd. Um, and uh, uh, so that's one of my first stops. Of course, the you know, comic books and graphic novels are, are a, a favorite spot. Uh, the electronic section uh, is, a, is a favorite haunt. I've found some really fantastic um, you know, just gear and gizmos and stuff that I didn't expect to find. So there's always a lot of really, um, you know, there's always like just things I wouldn't expect to find there. And I'm, and I really do enjoy the, the hunt for mm -hmm. something new and interesting. Um, and uh, uh, so af after the electronic section is the music section, um, in part because I do a lot of voiceover work and, you know, there's, there's often some gear that's very, very relevant to what I do. Um, one of my favorite headsets came from Bookman's and it was, you know, for next to nothing, hidden behind stuff on a shelf. Um, and, um, and then eventually I make my way, way around to the obvious choice, the entertainment section, you know, which has stuff about entertainment biographies and so on. Uh, and can typically find my wife in, uh, um, in the craft section or the history section or the cooking section. She's a professional chef uh, and also a, a set uh, or a, a props maker and so on for movies and so on. Um, so, uh, so that's kind of like, that's the cycle. And then eventually I make my way around the magazines, um, just to see if there's, you know, something I never would have bought when it was new, but is interesting. And, uh, and then, uh, you know, typically leave with an armful of stuff. <laughs> <laughs> that's the way it goes. You, you come in there looking for one thing, you end up leaving with, you know, just piles and piles. Uh, so, uh, what books, movies, or, uh, comic books or music are you recommending to your friends and family these days? Well, uh, I should note that I have very little time to read or watch movies right now because we're in uh, post-production on a bunch of projects, uh, fortunately, and, and also in production on some top secret things that are done distance and I can't say more about right now, but some really cool stuff coming down the pike, uh, as well as pending the release of Revenge of Zoe, so we're getting ready for the marketing push and so on. There's just not, I mean, I'm, you know, I work a lot, and, uh, uh, but that being said, um, uh, so in terms of, well, starting with, with books, um, I have a lot, I, it so happens that I have a lot of authors who I'm friends with and, uh, you know, most of whom I've met after I read their stuff and some I'm, I've met before. Um, so, uh, I certainly being a big sci-fi nerd, uh, I, well, for one thing, if you watch the Revenge of Zoe movie series, um, any of the authors in that movie is probably someone I've read extensively. Um, <laughs> um, so uh, uh, Timothy Zahn, um, uh, Linda Addison, Will Herr, uh, William Herr, I suppose is his name he goes by, uh, David Summers, um, uh, Jenny Lee Simner. Um, I, you know, authors both super well-known and somewhere in between and not as well-known. Um, I, I look for good stuff um, and, uh, and, and quite a few others. Um, uh, I'm a fan of uh, Jim Butcher's work, uh, which is the uh, the Dresden File series. That's a that's a favorite of mine. Uh, uh, I think just about everyone's a fan of Neil Gaiman. Um, uh, currently reading a, a fairly old book, a good friend of mine who I think you're going to interview soon uh, gave to me uh, called "Who Wrote Shakespeare," which is a uh, uh, a book about uh, kind of an evaluation of the many different. Uh, schools of thought on who might have actually written the works of Shakespeare, a lot of controversy and argument about that. And as, you know, a theater nerd, and in particular a Shakespeare nerd, that's a, an interesting topic to me. Um, and uh, uh, let's see, movie-wise, well, I mean, of course, you know, if it's nerdy, I, I'm, I'm in. Um, <laughs> <laughs> um, so, uh, you know, certainly the, the, the Marvel movie series, uh, the, um, um, I, I, uh, there, oh, I should mention, by the way, bookwise, uh, another uh, friend, um, 
really fascinating. I, the name is escaping me. I can't believe the name is escaping me, but Elizabeth Grayson of uh, Highlander fame um, wrote a really, really good young adult fantasy book uh, about a fairy. And I won't, won't say more, but look her up. You'll find the book. It's, it's exceptional. Um, really enjoyed reading that. Um, so of course, um, you know, I have a saying if I, in terms of movies, if I'm not in it, it's crap. Um, <laughs> It's a running joke between me and my friends. It's not actually true. I don't really believe that. <laughs> um, but uh, no, I, uh, I, I, you know, I, I have a very, I have very uh, despite that I'm a big nerd, I have really quite diverse tastes in film and television. Um, I just like well-made media and I like media that makes me think and feel. Um, for some reason, one in particular comes to mind that at least in the United States is rather obscure uh, which is a at this point a classic um, uh, in Japanese uh, sci-fi cinema called Returner, mm. uh, which I'm a huge fan of that film. Uh, really, uh, it's it was it's like an anime but live action with aliens and time travel. It's really excellent film, um, and I'm a fan of that. Um, uh, another thing is on the tip of my tongue. Um, Oh, short story. I mean, I, I, have, I have really big, diverse tastes in, in movies and uh, wide releases and, and small. I'm, I just like good cinema. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. Do you have a favorite um, media that you like to consume, uh, you know, like as a book or uh, a movie or, you know, like an LP or uh, a Laserdisc or, you know, what form of media uh, do you like the best? Good question. Um, you know, I, I've, I'm a huge fan of the streaming industry in general, mm -hmm. uh, and, and I really, I appreciate the, I appreciate particularly video streaming. I've, I've been interested in that since before it was really a big thing mm -hmm. and, uh, and a proponent of it and was trying to make media for it in advance right. um, because I knew it was going to be a thing. Um, so I, I love I love streaming series and the ability to stop exactly where you want to stop, go exactly where you want to go, rewatch something when you feel like it. I like that quite a lot. Mm -hmm. um, it, I mean, it's not uh, it's not something I'm doing right now because of the pandemic, but I there is a special place in my heart for sitting in a in a in a in a, in a movie theater in a cinema and watching. A, Watching a you know a feature film uh, that's a beautiful yeah, experience. Yeah, to watch movies. <laughs> oh, it's huh? you, Marty. Marty is oh, interrupting well, us. <laughs> is that Marty Kitola? Is that director Marty Kitola? You're, you're too busy <laughs> to watch movies. It's true. No, no, <laughs> Marty, Marty knows me well, and so here's the thing: uh, pe people people will. Uh, my, my colleagues in the, in the industry will often say, you know, like, in fact, one of my favorite directors will, will as a, you know, someone trying to direct me will say, you know, it's just like this film where they did this and this and this. I give them a blank stare. <sighs> We're having a movie night when this film is over <laughs> because I don't watch a lot. I, you know, I have to be very picky because I just don't have a lot of time to do it. Um, but uh, uh, so not nearly as I'd like to, which means that the bulk of my movie watching was done in my training so a lot of classic films um a lot of classic tv series and uh and then the occasional uh, newish one sure. um so you know i mean i'm a huge fan of things like uh, singing in the rain uh, me the, too uh, i love that movie <laughs> god i mean what a brilliant film um mm -hmm. i am a gigantic jackie chan fan oh yeah I'm a, I'm a martial artist i've studied uh kung fu for many years <laughs> and, and taught and uh um, and and being a you know movie person, uh, the just the the amazing work that he and his teams have pulled off over the years. Wow! So I, I absolutely love his work. I'm a gigantic fan, and Sammo Hung and all the other people around him, um, mm -hmm. certainly. Uh, so you know, there's not a Jack. Even 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 the movies that he has been in that weren't the greatest story. I still have a, still have a special place in my heart. That's um, amazing. And then, you know, good sci-fi, uh, what was the, um, Silent Running is one of my favorite films, uh, okay. classic 1970s film starring Bruce Dern. I had the wonderful experience of, uh, at an event that I was uh, co-producing uh, with, with some partners and, uh, uh, and the Loft Theater, um, of having a chat with Bruce Dern about that film um, and uh, getting some behind the scenes secrets, which was pretty damn cool as a nerd, nerd, nerd fan of that film. Oh, sure. Wow. <laughs> <laughs> How cool is that? So uh, moving on, what is the earliest film that you appeared in and uh, in what ways have you changed and grown as an actor since then? 
Mm. <laughs> well, hopefully a lot. I, I, <laughs> um, I think the very earliest, um, I'm trying to remember when I was a kid, I, it's kind of a blur. Um, so I, I have to kind of move to, to move to the adultish years. Um, and I, uh, I did a very early short film, uh, called, uh, Tales from the, uh, produced by a really good friend of mine, but I cannot remember the name of the film. Tales from the end of the film chain or something like that. And it was a silent film. Um, and, uh, um, uh, and that, that was, that was fun. I, I was, I was at that stage. I was also starting to do some uh just get my feet wet into some producing work um i have done so you know most of the early films that i did were very 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 micro budget and some of which were not very well put together um i'm thinking of one in particular that i'm not going to name um so as not to insult anybody but it's just an absolutely abysmal film um and and i wasn't great in it uh either you know um but uh uh and i played a detective in in that uh um, so over the years, though, uh, I, I mean, I think, I, again, I, I, I think my, my skills were pretty well honed by the time I really started to make a hard shift into film and did the occasional commercial and stuff, which, you know, in my mind, <clears throat> the types of commercials I was doing almost didn't count because they were just, you know, say a couple words and, you know, <laughs> um, uh, but uh, in terms of, you know, just in terms of performance skill, you just had the look and you said a couple words, um, but um, uh, you know, but over over time, I, I have at least seen uh, a, 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 pro a progression in my ability to get better and better at performing technically for the camera, as well as uh, I think I've also been able to challenge myself more and more to go deeper and deeper into sometimes, you know, parts of me that were very uncomfortable in order to yeah. find a character uh, sure. and being been willing to do that more and more and then for, as I like to put it, be emotionally naked on screen, um, <laughs> which, you know, early on, I think, I think I was maybe a little bit more demonstrative, a little bit more acty, um, you know, in terms of my, too much in my head. And, and, and since then, it's been more about, more and more about, um, can, can, there's a point where I find the character, when I find them, when I, when I've met them, and now I can be them. Mm -hmm. um, and, uh, um, you know, and, and I think some of my earlier works, you may not see that as well. Right, right. Huh. You have such a story to tell. I, I love that. Um, would you ever consider putting all this into a book? Uh, sure. I mean, if, if, if anybody might find it interesting, I don't really know <laughs> if they would. Um, I, I suppose, uh, you know, having, having lived in various places and, you know, been, uh, uh, known a lot of different people at different levels. Um, mm -hmm. I probably have some interesting stories to tell, I guess. So yeah, sure, sure. I'd be, I'd be interested in doing it at some point. Uh, if, I, I feel like for the, know. you know, for the, just a commoner like me, it, it's so <laughs> outside of my realm to think of like, you know, what goes on behind the scenes, what all happens and the, you know, what happens internally too. It, it would be fascinating mm -hmm. to, you know, dive into something like that. So. I guess you make a, a good point. I mean, it's it's a you know being being in the thick of it is not something everyone experiences, and uh, and but yet a lot of people consume the outcome. And I'm I'm I, I you know, I'm, I'm often I'm always fascinated by biographies of artists in in the multimedia industries, uh, and particularly people I like the work of, um, and uh, I learned a great deal from. So you know, perhaps there's something I can say that might be of interest to people, and be worth a shot, I suppose. Put that one in the back of your brain. <laughs> so uh, another project. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> another one. You're you're not busy at all these days, so you know why not have yeah. another one? <laughs> so you, on top of all of these uh, uh, fun things that you have done and are doing now, you're also involved in a uh, community called Sealy Studios. Tell us a little bit about that. Well, actually, Sealy Studios is a is a company, um, and it's but I, I think of it as a production group. Um, it was founded by my dear friend, uh, who is now unfortunately no longer with us, Don Dem, uh, who was a uh, uh, a genius. He was a he was early on in the podcast world. He went full bore on a podcast. He had around two million downloads with that podcast. He had a big fan base in the uh, board game and role playing game and analog gaming world. And so he was kind of a, 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 a not super well known, but within that world, a fairly well known pop culture icon. 
and uh, did a lot of you know interview shows and um, uh, eventually it evolved into doing uh, multimedia for uh, that industry including the, uh, the completely brilliant Bob and Angus show for what at the time was one of the five bi biggest uh, board game companies in the world Mayfair Games mm -hmm. which uh, that show ran 13 seasons almost 200 episodes of uh, branded entertainment on the web um, and it was a puppet show and it was just fantastic huh. um, co-starring uh, uh, someone else I think you're going to interview, uh, Drew Kalin of uh, Isle of Games. Um, uh, he played Angus, of uh, uh, Bob and Angus, and he was wonderful in that. So um, <clears throat> I met Don uh, when I was doing a voiceover gig for him. Um, I was cast by a friend and came and did the gig that night, and then we chatted for I don't know how long afterwards, well into the late, late night, um, and then just started meeting up and just, I, I remember there was a point where we met in a mall I think it was the Tucson Mall, actually, here in town. We met in the mall, and and, and I, I think I said to him, you know, you're a pretty smart guy, and I'm a pretty smart guy. We should do stuff together. We need to do film stuff together. And uh, hence came a wonderful relationship. And uh, uh, he unfortunately, um, several years ago, well, uh, he really about uh, a little less than, a little less than three years ago, was diagnosed with cancer. Mm -hmm. And uh, uh, in 2018, he... Uh, my math is off, but you get the idea. In 2018, November of 2018, he passed away. And prior to that, he started, uh, yeah, I had become a partner in the company and he asked if I would uh, take the reins. And so he started training me as best he could. And uh, when he passed, well, here I am <laughs> uh, running the company. And uh, so, you know, we do uh, uh, all kinds of multimedia work. Um, uh, we do um, uh, audio dramas, we do films, we do, uh, music videos, we do um, uh, uh, streaming series and so on and so on. We're, we're working on a lot of other stuff, big and small, and uh, um, uh, have a pretty neat history as, as an organization. And uh, um, with, uh, with a, what I believe is coming down the pike for us, we'll have an even neater history, I think. <laughs> Very cool. So uh, back when you were an actor, just you know, starting out, especially in film, uh, who were your biggest inspirations? Mm, that's a darn good question. Well, as I said uh, again, uh, Sid Charisse, uh, you know, taught me that I was a cisgendered male. Um, <laughs> uh, for anyone who doesn't know who Sid Charisse is and the and the relatively small but extremely impactful part she played in the film American in Paris. Just watch the film, you won't be sorry. And, uh, um, but she, you know, she was a, a commanding presence on film. Um, so certainly she was an influence. Um, I, I actually, for a long time, I was a huge Gene Kelly fan and I actually tried to learn tap dancing. And when we lived in LA, uh, I actually went to a tap dancing school that was run by one of his choreographers. And then I learned that I was not good at tap dancing. <laughs> um, but I, I actually met uh, uh, Gene Kelly once uh, in a library and uh, chatted with him briefly. Um, so that was a big influence on me. Um, uh, you know, Spencer Tracy, um, a lot of my you know, role models uh, are, are uh, are, are male actors, you know, because that's how I identify. Um, uh, John Amos, uh, another uh, who, who some will remember from Roots, some will remember from his amazing role in the classic TV series, Good Times, uh, is another one of my role models, uh, just an amazing, intense, brilliant actor. Um, uh, other role models include my, my parents, my mom and my dad, uh, Paul and Joan Schumacher, are both incredibly brilliant actors who raised me into the art. And Paul Manti, who was, my dad's best friend actually as a kid and neither of them came from artistic families but they both became actors and uh, Paul Menti was uh, best known as uh, in the 1960s um, uh, he starred in a movie called Robinson Crusoe on Mars classic sci-fi film um, and, and in fact had a small part played by Adam West of classic Batman fame um, and but Paul was a lead and, uh, and he was brilliant in that film and he, he was in big films like uh, The Great Santini, he had a fairly large role in and so on. He was a regular on the, the 80s TV series, uh, Cagney and Lacey. Um, and he, uh, he also taught me quite a lot about, particularly he would focus on, you know, kind of career strategy and uh, sanity strategy in the industry and so on. Um, and he and my dad would have protracted arguments about acting technique, which was, a, which was funny. Um, <laughs> um, 
so that's another one of my great influences. Um, you know, really, truly, my, my biggest influences, though, as performers were my parents. They're, they're just so brilliant and uh, really, uh, you know, I tried to be half the actor that either of them are. Um, and uh, and there's endless other great performers who I truly admire of every possible race, creed, gender, et cetera. Um, so it, that's just the very short list of those early influences, I suppose. Sure. I say. Very cool. Uh, do you have any uh, pre-performance rituals that you do? Yes, I do, actually. Um, so a uh, couple of things. I mean, first off, it, some of it depends on the character. Um, there are certain things that help me nail a particular character and help me hold on to the character. It's almost like, you know, with certain things, I'll find that with a particular character, if I do a particular thing, mm -hmm. it's sort of like pulling their file out. Um, <laughs> Uh, an example of that is I was in a, a theater show a while back, uh, directed by uh, my friend Doug Mitchell, and uh, I had I was having a horrible time finding the character, and uh, I just couldn't really find a real person in there. And he asked the um, stage manager to go get him a toothpick, and he handed me the toothpick. He said, "Put this in your mouth; it never comes out." Bam! There was a character. So I needed that toothpick from that point on, um, and uh, so. But, but in terms of general rituals, there's a couple of things. Um, uh, you know, I, I do tend to pray uh, before, <laughs> before a performance because, you know, it's still a lot of pressure, especially the, if you play a bigger character, there's a great deal of pressure to get this right and to really nail it. Um, I also, uh, I, I, something an acting teacher taught me a while back where I'll do a, a, a practice of visualizing taking the mask of me off and putting it on a pedestal and placing the mask of the character on my face um, so that I'm actually putting myself aside temporarily and now I'm this person huh. and it really helps get my mind there. The other thing that I do religiously is I, I go over the four concentrations of Stanislavski. Who am I? Where am I? What am I doing? And what do I want to do? And I have to answer those four questions in a way that's satisfactory to me before I perform. And that also just, again, helps me to kind of, you know, you perform in a lot of different environments. You may be in front of a green screen, you may be in hot weather, playing playing cold weather. So really doing that helps me to just completely visualize um, my whole environment. I sometimes will ask, what does it smell like here? What's the weather like? You know, things like that to try to add to that and try to help me just completely center in on being fully present in that moment. That is incredible. Uh, so the the film industry has changed and it, you know it's constantly going to be evolving and you know getting better sometimes getting worse um and i mean like even over the past 10 to 20 years i i mean everything has evolved so much uh so throughout your career what changes have you seen in the film industry uh the good and the bad ones well, a lot, <laughs> a lot really. <laughs> and it should be noted that things have changed very, very, very quickly. Um, mm -hmm. You know, when I was first uh, contemplating a career in film, um, everything was done on actual film. Mm -hmm. um, it's only, you know, I guess what now the past, it's, it hasn't been really all that long considering the length of the film industry that, um, you know, the things have been done digitally primarily. Um, so that's been a, that in itself has been a big shift for one, the fact that um, with current film technology, one can shoot a quality piece of film for exponentially less than ever really possible in history. I mean, the, the quality of comparatively inexpensive gear, um, you know, I, I, hell, I, right behind me, uh, you can't see because I have this virtual backdrop up with the Revenge of Zoe poster, but uh, there's an LED light that simply didn't exist at a price that you could remotely afford, uh, if at all, 10 years ago, you know, and it's a little LED light that I picked up for $30 on a very small light stand. And I have a ton of those for filmmaking and, uh, and they work really well for certain circumstances. So, you know, whereas an equivalent light, um, you know, way back would have cost hundreds of dollars. Mm -hmm. not, that, uh, not that some quality lights don't still cost that, right? <laughs> but, but there are alternatives. Um, the, uh, the transition from editing a film by physically cutting it, developing it and cutting it versus nonlinear non -linear digital editing where it's a digital file that gets loaded up onto a computer and you just move stuff around. I saw that happen. Uh, when I was first studying film, we were using, you know, that was how we edited. 
uh, it was on, you know, mind you, the, back, the school I was studying in was very underfunded at the time, so we were actually using ancient equipment, but, but it was really before nonlinear digital editing was extremely widespread. Um, so we were using like a half inch tape and physically cutting it. Uh, and that was, uh, so it's, uh, I've seen a, just massive transitions there. Distribution has changed massively. Streaming has changed everything. And mostly in some very positive ways. It's, it's, it's come closer to democratizing releases. I mean, uh, uh, Revenge of Zoe is a, you know, a pretty small budget film and that it, it, it would not get a re any kind of even remotely reasonable release had it, if it were not for streaming. Same with some other projects I've worked on. Um, it's uh, created, on the other hand, it's also, you know, some of the, uh, it has made it, so the, the, the um, profit side of film may have suffered a bit because of streaming uh, to some degree. And that means that, you know, basically if a film doesn't make money, it's very hard to make another film. <laughs> um, so there's that. Um, the speed at which things are released and then no longer a hot item has, has been has been has changed rapidly so there's more media produced at this point than it, well it's covid notwithstanding prior to covid no, more media being released than at any point in history just tons and tons of it and i think maybe the biggest uh, thing overall in the industry is uh, the the choice that audiences have um you know uh, as a bit of a student of film history you know, there was a time where uh, there were a couple of blockbusters a year, yeah. right? Yeah. You know, and that, and everybody went to see them. And there were, you know, just a just a small smattering compared to today of television channels. There was no such thing as as uh, as streaming or, or even the internet, really. Um, and uh, so everybody had kind of a shared experience. There were maybe five channels that everybody could get. Uh, at one point, and and or in some cases even less than that in the earlier on, and uh, and so people could kind of bond around the few things that they had options to watch, um, and uh, so on the one hand that meant that the system was much more controlled, and there was far less, far 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 less representation, for example, of different ethnicities, et cetera, than even today, which uh, which is you know we're, we're still bearing the brunt of that socially of not having that uh, in our past and I hope it will continue to improve. Um, and also just, you know, there were just, there was such a very few voices that could get their, their media out to anyone. Um, but on the other hand, there was kind of a shared social experience around them. So positives and negatives there. Yeah, absolutely. <laughs> Alrighty, so if you could give some advice to actors or even producers just starting out, sure. um, what would you give them? Uh, well, a lot. <laughs> I, uh, I, I have actually several people I mentor right now and I give occasional, uh, you know, like when I've, when I've done uh, uh, sci-fi cons and comic cons and stuff, one of my favorite things to do is actually give classes on various aspects because there's a lot of people just interested in sure. getting started. And I, I love connecting with people and just, dumping whatever knowledge I have, so it might be helpful. Um, so uh, uh, anyway, I think there's a piece of advice, and I've said this in a number of interviews, I'll say it again, because it's really important. Um, it, it was given to me by uh, Paul Manti. Um, and he said, I want you to think about, and, th and this applies to both filmmakers and actors, really anyone in any field, but especially the arts, he said, I want you to think really hard about this. Is there anything that you could possibly do with your life that isn't this, that would make you feel fulfilled? And if so, go do that, please, because this is a really difficult industry. It's a really difficult thing to do. It will take a lot of sacrifice and discipline to be successful at, if you can. Uh, there's no guarantees. So if, you, on the other hand, if you cannot think of anything else that you could do that would make you feel fulfilled, then sorry, you're an actor or whatever it is, you know, and, and uh, suck it up and do it. <laughs> um, and that was a really important piece of advice. I think to go with that, it is extremely important that when one is starting out, they really explore themselves. What do they, why do they want to be in the arts? What is the motivation here? If your motivation is um, to purely to be liked, if your motivation is to, um, you know, is, is more of an egocentric, um, motivation, then you, you might find it difficult to sustain in this industry. 
we all have egos, don't get me wrong. I mean, you know, certainly I do. You're, I'm on screen. I like seeing myself on screen if, I'm, if I think I'm any good, which is, you know, I'm hard on myself, so maybe I shouldn't have said that. But, <laughs> um, <laughs> but uh, you know, it, it's important that you really understand yourself deeply, particularly as an actor, because the better you understand yourself, the more likely you are to play your characters convincingly and the more likely you are as well to really be dedicated enough to this to weather all of the many, many, many storms you are likely to weather in this industry. Mm -hmm. uh, it's so hard to get anywhere in it and it can be soul crushing if you aren't, uh, if you don't have some kind of balance in your life and if you don't uh, um, really know yourself and understand that you know those million rejections that you might get uh, are part of the process and you better A, learn to figure out how to improve and B, just learn that sometimes everyone gets rejected a lot and sometimes everyone has dry periods and it's hard to take. And there's lots of other things to face. Incredible. So that's advice. the main advice. Yeah, I love that. Yeah, absolutely. So uh, one of Bookman's core values here is, um, you know, we do not believe that uh, you shouldn't you know, read what you want to read. You you have to read what you want to read. <laughs> uh, and, you know, that censorship is such a pandemic that it, you know, explodes in so many different forms of media, i.e. books or music and um, even film. So how have you seen uh, censorship leak into the film industry? It's always been present in some form, um, you know, early on. Um, I, I, I remember as I, you know, uh, this is well, 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 well before my time, but of course I study classic stuff. So um, take the um, uh, I Love Lucy, early comedy, comedy early, early sitcom, um, actually kind of groundbreaking in that it was an early sitcom in that there were two different ethnicities as a married couple on national television in the United States, and I guess it was the 1950s. Um, so that already was, you know, but the, so it's a married couple and because of censorship in the show, when you were in their bedroom, they were sleeping in different beds. They couldn't be in the same bed. That was censorship. It's asinine. They're a married couple for crying out loud, you know, um, of course, uh, you know, there's been, uh, there's been overt and not as overt. Um, censorship related to to race, uh, related to, I mean, one of the most absurd stories I remember uh, reading about is the, uh, now of course as a martial arts student, I, I watched uh, um, the, the classic 70s TV show Kung Fu starring David Carradine, and apparently that show was originally supposed to star Bruce Lee, but the network executives didn't feel that an audience could take a story about a Shaolin monk who was also Chinese. To Shaolin monk. <laughs> so they cast a not Chinese person in that role and came up with this cock and bull story about, you know, him being uh, like half Asian or some such. And it was still a great series, but Bruce Lee, for God's sake. You know, <laughs> you know so uh, and on and on. Uh, we have interest, censorship is really interesting today in that uh, um, one can get a lot more on screen than ever before in history. And because of recent social outcry, thank goodness, we're seeing a lot more, although there's still a lot of problems, but they're seeing a lot more diversity in, uh, in multimedia. And that's, a, that's ultimately, I, I, as I said, I hope it continues to go in that direction. Um, and we're also seeing a lot more stories about different, amazingly enough, especially in big Hollywood, they seem to have just recently discovered that there is actually an audience that will watch African Americans on the screen. Who who knew? Except <laughs> all the millions of people who wanted like Black Panther to be made. I mean, that was actually hard for them to get that made. And it's like every nerd in existence is going, "Will you give me a freaking Black Panther?" You know? <laughs> and of all race, creeds, and colors, you know. Sure. So, um, but we're also seeing some interesting stuff. Like um, one thing that is, uh, it's not exactly. It isn't, it isn't censorship, but so the largest film market in the world uh, is China. Mm -hmm. And so as a result, you know, of course, the, the Chinese government has very specific um, likes and dislikes about what you can put on screen and, the, you know, the, the social messages around them. So, for example, one big controversy was, and, and this is not, you know, so China itself has censorship. That's the way the government is set up. 
Um, but film companies that want to release in China have to be very conscious of that if they want to make money from the Chinese market, they have to make sure that what they put out there is not offensive to the Chinese government. Mm -hmm. So for example, when the movie Doctor Strange was released, uh, which by the way, that should have been me. Um, <laughs> once upon a time, I kid you not, I wrote a letter to Stan Lee and I said, listen, if you ever make a Doctor Strange movie, I need that role. Of course it was. <laughs> I got, I got, you know, his, his assistant or something sent me a polite, we don't know who the hell you are, leave us alone note. <laughs> but, but I mean, I, I that should have been me. I, I Benedict Cumberbatch is great, but should have been. Anyway, um, short story though, uh, those of us who were big, you know, nerdy fans of Doctor Strange know that the ancient one was a Tibetan, an elderly Tibetan sorcerer. Mm -hmm. And uh, the, my, my understanding is that they instead cast Tilda Swinton as a, an ancient Celtic sorcerer. She did a wonderful job, don't get me wrong, um, but they did that because that would have been offensive to China. Mm -hmm. And uh, so, you know, so that's, it's, it's, a, it's, a, it's, it's sort of like market censorship now. And that's not the only thing, you know, basically at the end of the day, this is art, but it's also, uh, it's, it's also a commodity. And, you know, the, the, the catch 22 is always that if you release something, you want to make an artistic statement, but you, but if it doesn't make money, then you can't make another film. And so that balance between where do I, keep my distributor happy? Where do I keep my, my platform happy? Where do I keep, you know, the, the different, uh, various different film markets out there happy? Every country has its own, I, I use China as an example, because that was a big deal in the nerd world. But, mm -hmm. um, you know, but there's, but every country has its, you know, different proclivities, and some of them have different rules and laws. And certainly certain films are not going to do as well in certain parts of the United States, and they will in others, if they're, um, you know, for example, certain parts of the Deep South won't, won't care for a movie about, uh, you know, or won't, won't get as much distribution uh, if the theaters are owned by folks with a particular mindset, if it has a very progressive uh, uh, storyline in some cases. So, um, so censorship has become almost democratized censorship and market-based censorship um, more so well, than in the past. Yeah, it's amazing how the film industry is, it's so social in that regard. Like, you yeah. know, it's a, it's a conversation that you have to have uh, you know, yeah. metaphorically between so many different industries and areas and people. And you have, and you have to think it through. You really have oh, to yeah. think it through. It's, uh, you know, there are other cases where, uh, you know, the, there's sort of the reverse thing going on uh, from, uh, uh, from diversity where, you know, Hollywood is looking to put, uh, to put, to change characters into different ethnicities than they were in their source fiction so as to make so as to to show more of an effort towards diversity, and in some cases that's a that's a that's a, a, a strange shift, you know. Um, <laughs> and uh, and in other cases it works beautifully. I personally uh, really, for example, Samuel L. Jackson as uh, Nick Fury, Agent of Shield. I dug it, you know. I mean, I, and I was a fan of Nick she uh, Nick Fury in the original comics. It's a it's a basically a somewhat different character, but he's still the same sort of badass. I mean. You know, and, <laughs> Uh, so in some cases it works and others it, it, it doesn't. Um, but uh, so there's all kinds of those influences though altogether that have to be considered. And it's kind of a crapshoot almost as to what will fly with, with the public now. Um, whereas uh, at least, you know, uh, at least when things were horrifically censored, <laughs> everyone was doing, you know, in ways that, that stunted society's growth, I might add, and created terrible images uh, that, you know, or just, you know, created a, images in the mindset of, of, of people that probably helped in, in ways subtle and not so subtle to, um, uh, to stunt our growth as a society in terms of race relations and gender relations and all that. Sure. But on the other hand, since everyone had these limitations, it was a clearer pathway to release this and at least, you know, and people are going to go see it. Besides, there's only three movies. <laughs> you know? uh, now, I should say, actually, that isn't entirely true, of course, because here in the United States, there was also like a side ethnic industry. So like, for example, an entire industry of African-American filmmakers that were making unbelievably great films at the same time, you know, as they could not be leads in you know, major motion pictures in the 1940s, uh, made by big, you know, by, by uh, quotes, mainstream studios. Um, so it's, uh, but that, that again, is, is the effect of censorship. I mean, you know, today it's, today, today, at least more often, they're actually casting people just based on who seems to be a good fit for the role, 
versus, you know, has to be blonde, white, male as the hero, you know, <laughs> um, it still happens, but, you know, it's at least it's more often that we will see, see that diversity. Here's hoping anyway. it will continue to change in the, <laughs> for the yeah. better, you know, there's a lot that we need to fix and work on, but, you know, at least we're getting somewhere. <laughs> uh, so, do you have any projects that you uh, will be releasing soon? I do, most of which I can't talk about. Um, <laughs> <laughs> um, so the stuff that I can say something about, um, and I'm and believe me, I'm anxious to. I just I just can't. We're we're not ready for that. Um, but I, I obviously uh, you know I've got the poster up behind me. Revenge of Zoe um, is, uh, releasing soon. We don't have a final release date yet. Um, but, uh, that's a, a nerd comedy set largely in a comic book store. Um, and, uh, uh has some great cameos from, from some, uh, some fairly well-known industry folks. And it's basically, uh, you know, a, a fun story about, uh, um, uh, insanity, um, uh, comic books, um, movie making, friends um and uh uh and and imperfect people loving each other anyway uh it's it's a really great storyline and I'm, I'm a big fan so i'm Absolutely. glad i'm in it um, and uh one of the producers is our very own marty tola that is uh, which correct. is very exciting i am super stoked for him uh yay <laughs> So that is a, that is another uh, story. There was a casting call held for the previous film uh, mm -hmm. when I was uh, when I not long after I'd gotten to uh, to Tucson, um, and uh, and and I came to the conference room at Bookman's to answer <laughs> that casting call and got the character of John Burns. And when I saw the script, I was like, I need to play this character. He is me. <laughs> so uh, that's another way that Bookman's changed my life. I should add. That's super cool. So where can our viewers uh, follow along on your artistic journey? Well, um, I'm all over social media, um, Facebook, Instagram, Twitter, uh, LinkedIn, uh, currently the primary sources. So just look me up, Eric Schumacher. If you can spell my name, I wish you luck with that. Um, <laughs> um, also, you can find Sealy Studios all over social media and uh, one of our sister brands that uh, we're going to relaunch some things with that was kind of actually our original name pulp gamer media um you can also find my website eric schumacher film.com you can find sealy studios.com um and uh, check out what we have going there um and um hopefully if things go really well um i'll be easier and easier to uh, to find so to speak uh, you know assuming that things launch well and strong i uh, should also add by the way that another uh, uh, tombstone rashomon launched in 2020. Uh, it is available streaming on uh, Amazon and a bunch of other platforms and also on DVD if you should be so inclined. Uh, so if you're if you happen to be a fan of Alex Cox's work in particular uh, and if you happen to be uh, uh, if you're really interested in the history of the uh, the gunfight at the quotes OK Corral or Fremont Street and in, in fact where it really was um, then uh, it's it's worth a watch. Uh, um, I'm in it. <laughs> and, so of course, uh, it's the best. <laughs> so of course, it's the best ever. Um, but uh, um, yeah, so so you know, so worth worth looking for. I hope, um, and uh, we'll have a lot of stuff actually releasing uh, over the next few months. Uh, so I hope that everyone will hear about a lot of stuff. <laughs> Definitely, Eric. It was a pleasure interviewing you. Thank you for all your uh, wonderful insight into the film industry. My pleasure, absolutely pleasure. Uh, thanks for doing what you do over there. As I said, you know, Bookman's is a very favorite place of mine and uh, um, uh, has been important to me in many ways. I could go on actually. Um, and uh, so I'm, I'm very pleased to take part and uh, I look forward to chatting with you guys again.